Um, this second session on data is entitled More and New Types of Data Are Required. And I am going to turn you over to the uh, incredibly capable uh, Michael DeWong, who also has been a co-chair of this conference since inception, guiding our way as well, particularly in the data front. Um, Michael is head of innovation at Hoffman La Roche. Uh, he um, is uh, responsible for um, all of its divisions, including Roche Pharmaceuticals, Roche Diagnostics, and Roche Diabetes from an innovation perspective. He also leads the Roche Innovation Hive, which is the creative space where the future of healthcare is being imagined and co-created between Roche and its external partners. I can think of no one more appropriate to chair this panel than Michael. And I'll pass him over to introduce the rest of the panelists. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Is it on? Oh, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, so it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce the panel. Before I go into that, I think um, just wanted to thank the organizers and, and especially Barry for, for continuing to host this conference. We were just talking about how amazing you know, this meeting is, and it's, it's just great to have everybody back in person again. Super excited that we can meet and see each other and, and you know, do the workshop tomorrow um, in person. Um, Anne-Marie, she asked me, do you want me to introduce the panel or, or do you want to do it? And I said, no, 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 like it's my favorite thing to do like on a panel is to introduce people. Um, because it's less about like their LinkedIn titles, which I have here, um, but it's more about like how, how you know, I know them, how we meet, how, how we work together and, and the personal connection. So let me start with the intro. Um, I'll just walk you through. We're not gonna have any slides. I've been told and I've experienced that the session after lunch is the worst session <laughs> to do. Um, so we're gonna try to you know, keep it informal, pick up the energy, let you digest your meal, um, and then, and then you know, refocus you um, into this topic. So, so let me dive in with Dr. Henry Conter. Uh, his LinkedIn title says he's the <laughs> Portfolio Manager, Early Development, Clinical Oncology. Um, and he is also, for, for Hoffman LaRoche, uh, and then he is also a medical oncologist, uh, oncologist at William Osler Health System. Uh, and we were just talking about this out in the hallway that um, he's always been a medical oncologist and I was part of the team that brought him to Roche uh, and, and interviewed him and brought him into Roche. And, I think I even asked the question, like, why do you want to come to Roche? Like, because you're a medical oncologist, you're doing all this amazing stuff. Um, and Henry just basically said, like, I want to make a difference. Like, I want to take all the opportunities I can take in my professional and personal career to make a difference. And this is a, an opportunity for me to make a difference. And he's been doing that both in the Canadian organization and now globally um, uh, working in, in our clinical development space. So. Henry, now we have Alan. Alan has a longer title, so I have to read that. <laughs> Alan is the Vice President of Innovation, Transformation, and Clinical Performance for McGill University Health Center, and he is also full professor of health innovation at McGill University. Now, Alan... <laughs> I knew of Alan way before I knew Alan. So uh, w one of my other hats is I'm, I'm the co-founder of an organization called CFIN, the Canadian Personalized Healthcare Innovation Network. And our CEO at the time was Jack Kitts. We brought him in and, and Jack, ever like day one he started, he couldn't stop talking about this Alan guy and how like CFIN couldn't run without Alan. Um, and it's just not innovative without Alan. And I'm like, who is Alan? <laughs> so like introduce me to Alan and we got introduced um, and I find out that he is one of the most innovative people in the world. And that is not an observation. That is like, he's got awards that says he's one of the most innovative people in the world. He's won awards for this. So, th so that is a lot of external, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, credibility and, and confirmation of, of that title. So 
pleased to have Alan on the, on the panel. And lastly, we have Shanil Pathak. Um, he is co-founder of Zamplo. Um, this is a really interesting company. Uh, and I, I met Shanil just for this panel. He was, he was brought up and said, you know, it's a perfect opportunity to have somebody who is passionate about patients, passionate about patient contribution to their own health. Uh, and, and, you know, leveraging whatever they can to contribute to the improvement of their own care um, and bring them into a panel. And I'll be totally honest with you, we almost designed this entire panel to bring uh, Chanel in. So, so there you go. <laughs> no, no pressure. And then, and then I said, who, who can I fill the other two seats with? <laughs> No, um, it, it, it's an incredible pleasure to have all three of you on. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what this panel is going to talk about. Um, we've heard this morning a lot about clinical trials and a lot about what we can do to improve the clinical trial infrastructure in Canada, what we can learn, what we can do with clinical trials um, to improve participation, uh, recruitment, um, a lot of these discussions. Then we heard about the need for different types of data coming out of uh, clinical trials and clinical practice, quite frankly. How the traditional data that you collect within a clinical trial, the controlled data, are not sufficient to inform all of the different uncertainties that we have on the therapies that we bring to market and the therapies that we put into patients. This panel is really going to be talking about that. It's going to deep dive into, um, I think this session is called uh, more and different types of data uh, are, are required, and, and that's exactly what it is, is that the complexity of these therapies, the data that we're generating, the uncertainty around the products that we're bringing to market, we need more and different types of data to inform our ability to make decisions around them and, you know, clin clinicians' abilities to bring them and, treat, and use them to treat patients. So we're going to go on a journey of the evolution of data requirements and how we're fulfilling them. We'll start out with clinical development in traditional clinical trials from a manufacturer's perspective and ask the question, how are we changing clinical trials that are being sponsored by manufacturers, because that's our perspective, to, in order to collect different types of data, the data that are required um, by decision makers, the data that are required to inform effectiveness. Then we go into, from there, you know, you have the clinical trial, you get the regulatory approval, you go and you now you have clinical practice. We collect a lot of data in, cl in clinical practice, most of it is real world data. How are we able to use the real world data now to inform these decisions? So what are we doing differently to provide access to it? What are we doing in hospitals? What are clinicians doing to collect different types of data? Um, and then lastly, I mean all of that is within the quote unquote health institutions, right? It's within the clinical trial institution, it's within the care institution. Now we leave the institution and say there's a lot of data being generated from patients, by patients, outside of a care institution, and how are we collecting um, those types of data, uh, and you know what's available, what platforms are available for us to collect those data, and where do we go from there? So that's the journey that our panelists will take you through. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to Henry to start our conversations. So thanks so much for that. I also want to link this back to the patient specifically. And I want to start by sharing a story about someone that I just saw the other week. You know, he's a young guy who is actually six years out from his original rectal cancer diagnosis. And when he was first diagnosed with rectal cancer, it was early stage, it was caught early. So I remember speaking to him and the plan was chemotherapy and radiation, followed by surgery, followed by more chemotherapy. And I always remember patients with rectal cancer because it was the very first rotation I ever did in my fellowship. And I remember this because I had the meanest, the meanest medical oncologist. He was wonderful to patients, he hated fellows because we asked questions. And I remember saying, this was my plan. I saw a very similar patient on the first day. I said, this was my plan. We we're gonna do chemotherapy radiation, we we're gonna do surgery, and we're then we're gonna recommend um, keep more chemotherapy afterwards. And he turns to me and he says, do you know why we give radiation beforehand? And I said, 
because that's what my book said we're supposed to do. <laughs> and he was so disappointed in me. Um, he said, well, do you know why that's the, what the book said? And I said? Well, you know, there's a great study. It shows that this is a benefit to patients. That's the, I don't really know what I'm talking about answer. And he pointed out that the reason why we give radiation before surgery is not because it improves overall survival, not because it improves some kind of surrogate metric like progression-free survival, but because it improves sphincter sparing. You get to keep your rectum, or at least the part of the rectum that controls your bowel movements. This is not, in today's day and age, that's not considered a, quote, hard endpoint. These aren't our overall survival metrics. But as soon as you hear that, of course, that's something that's extremely valuable. The only way you would know that that was valuable, though, is if you've either seen patients or gone through it yourself. And I feel like, and we feel like, that we've lost a lot of that in the shuffle of all of this data that exists. We don't really know what patients truly value, what it is they're scared of, what it is that they're hoping new therapies will ultimately bring, and that's something that is incredibly important for us as a company as we're thinking about how we design not only the end stage trial, the late stage trial, the phase three trial, the registration trial, but instead how do we actually think about what are the things that we can learn early on to determine which drugs will ultimately benefit patients and how do we get them in the hands of patients faster. So one of the key issues that we face when we're designing a lot of these trials is, uh, especially in the early settings, we have to rely on binary endpoints. Response rate in cancer is the most common one, but response rate doesn't really correlate to these hard outcomes that we're ultimately looking for. Um, instead, what we use in those late-stage trials is time-to-event endpoints like progression-free survival or overall survival, but in order to do that, in order to get that kind of information, you need to randomize patients, you need a lot of patients, and that, as you can tell, quickly becomes very expensive, and by the time you're talking about all that, you're really talking about a registration trial. We don't have the ability to do that, and quite frankly, it's not ethical to do that when you don't know enough about the drug as is. And so this is when we start, we're, are starting to look at new types of endpoints that can, those types of binary endpoints that could really lead to um, quicker decision making, so quicker decision making early on. So for example, I'm really a big advocate of what the FDA is doing with the patient reported outcome, uh, CT, CTCAE, the toxicity reporting so that we get it not from clinicians who are projecting what they imagine you're experiencing, but instead actually getting it directly from patients. I really love what's being done in the neoadjuvant setting where we're starting to test drugs early on to determine whether or not you see an effect in terms of early, some of those early endpoints, but we're not yet asking patients you know, what it is they wanted. So for example, when we're talking about breast cancer and we're talking about early phase, early stage breast cancer, you know, we often talk about the difference between a lumpectomy and a mastectomy. You know, these are really important outcomes or can be really important things to individual patients, the extent of surgery, and having the ability to choose which surgery they ultimately want to have. And these are not things that we're currently uh, collecting. Similarly, when we're thinking about quality of life, we're often missing the key areas that patients are experiencing. So my favorite example of that is a rare disease called myelofibrosis. Um, where someone's spleen can get extremely large. Now, the first drugs that were developed for this, they weren't actually looking at spleen shrinkage as being one of their primary endpoints, but when it actually came to the funding review here in Canada, that's the specific discussion around what that meant to patients was the difference between an initial rejection of funding for the first pharmaceutical in that area into a recommendation for funding because of what that meant for patients. And so all that, to, to sum all this up, what we're doing at Roche right now is we're looking for, we're really scouring for these early patient-centered endpoints that can truly indicate upfront, independent of some of these other time to event endpoints, that our medicines can bring value so that we can, number one, bring those to patients sooner once we have detected that value, and number two, have greater confidence when we're going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in a lot of these um, large phase three trials, that we have a greater sense of security knowing that the patients that are ultimately going to be on these trials are truly going to benefit from them. And so I'm hoping to talk more about that through this discussion and I'll, I'll hand it over. Alan, you're next. Good. <clears throat> Thanks, and um, I'm glad my 
sort of bribery to Jack Kitts paid off, Mike. Uh, um, no, it's been, uh, I, I'm going to share a little bit of a perspective really from a healthcare provider point of view. And, and I, you know, I'm, as we mentioned, I'm a vice president uh, in a teaching hospital. Up until recently, I've been at the Ottawa Hospital and I've spent most, most of my career there. And I would just say that, um, you know, I started my career, I'll start with a story like Henry, but you know, with a simple idea that, you know, our patients and our people in our communities deserve better quality of care. And fundamentally, our, our gap is we don't have data to decide to tell people what is the quality of care. And, you know, qu quality of care means a lot of different things. Ultimately, it's about patients realizing outcomes that are important to them. Um, we don't, you know, if we had data on this we, and, and people had access to this data, we could decide what the priorities are, we could define where those priorities, we, you know, deserve action, we could design interventions, and we could evaluate the impact of those interventions, and we could then move on to the next problem. And that's the simple idea. Um, it sounds simple, but I can tell you from experience uh, that, and I can tell you from my working with health systems around the world that very few institutions, almost no institutions, can fulfill that promise of tracking patient outcomes that matter in a systematic way that they can then engage their clinical teams, engage their communities of practice to work towards solving those problems that exist in terms of our, our quality, and that access, effective efficiency, safety, and patient-centeredness. And, and it, it, it's just, it's a simple idea and yet we can't do it. And that, and no one's doing it. Like, it, you, know, you know, we can speak of different jurisdictions where there may be some better examples and some good things happening, but fundamentally it's not happening. And I, I think we need to take a hard look at the industry itself as to why that's not happening. I've spent a fair bit of time on data um, and really that piece of data. Um, and, you know, looking at the promise of electronic medical records that they now are not only at the point of care for the physician and the nurse and the other providers, but they're also now patients are accessing them and patients are actually entering into information. Now we have devices, information coming through. So now we have this rich source of information data to, to start this loop from, from address, being addressed. And the problems are many fold and many people have talked about how why we're not getting data. Like, part of it is the data quality, part of it is the diversity of the systems that we use, part of it is privacy. I, I would argue that what the main problem is is that we don't think we need to work on it, that it's just magic that it will become available. Um, and the amount of money that's needed to invest in data systems to make data exposed to, to people is actually trivial compared to the overall investment we make in healthcare, but it's not trivial in, the, in, the, in, in, in real terms. There, there is a money that needs to be spent, there's capacity that's required to be built, and that doesn't just include the analysts and the people working with the data, it's people, the managers and the management, and it's actually the public and the you know, people who support healthcare because unless you have that capacity, people don't know what to do with the data. They don't know whether to, you know, whether this variation in care is important and it's something they should be acting on. They don't know if this p-value, what does it actually mean? And until you get to that level of understanding with data, you will not be able to drive value from it. Um, and so I'll just say, just to close, there are some new solutions coming on the pipeline, which I think are going to change the culture. We'll hear about Zamplona in a moment, but I think, you know, at a health system level, platforms that allow the workforce and broader groups of people to get access to data um, in a way that is, um, doesn't require uh, a degree in data science or a privacy overview, like review, are going to be the, the differentiators that allow individual health systems to rapidly evolve. Um, and, and that's where I feel that we should be driving for health systems to, and then I think we can start to see health systems connect up with each other uh, with learning. And I'm, I'm happy to share more on, on that as we go. 
Great, great. Janelle. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll tell a bit, I'll share a story about Zamplo, its origin story. Then I go in, I'll go into um, the different technologies to report health data and what's coming out, Made in Canada solutions. Um, so Zamplo is, is a social enterprise. I'm CEO and co-founder. Uh, it's, uh, um, the vision of Zamplo is we want every person, wherever they are, to have the data, the resources, and a community for them to live their best possible life. Now, how we do that is we created an integrated data platform to collect PROMs, um, PREMs, as well as technology-reported outcome measures, collect that for the individual to analyze and take action on it, but also provide to either clinical research or clinical care, no matter who they are. So it's not only your, your, your cancer center, it could be anybody that's in your care circle. And... Um, an actual case example, uh, it's right now being used at Princess Margaret. It's being tested for remote monitoring. Uh, so the benefit there is that individuals after post-radiation therapy, um, they take home, they get a, they download a, a customized version of Zamplo, um, they fill out the problems and prems, uh, the, the radiation technician is reviewing it, and based on trending, we'll either call them in or give them self-help and self-care information through the platform. Uh, the goal here is to allow individuals to stay at home for those who, don't, who can be managed at home and then identify the ones who are um, um, uh, having, having more severe side effects and, and then bring them in, to, right? So, so the, uh, the clinicians benefit from reduced congestion, individuals benefit from not parking. And that is the number one in Toronto, at Prince Edward, the, one of the number one complaints mm -hmm. at Princess Margaret from cancer patients is, is parking um, and, and obviously commuting. Um, that in itself will help improve quality of life of the caregiver and the individual. Now, this morning there was a quote about, now I'm gonna switch, switch topics. There's a quote about um, if you could measure it, then you could improve it. It was William Thomas, he was the inventor of the Kelvin scale or the temperature, or the thermometer. So, so that's the 18th century. Let's fast forward to just yesterday. I was at the Burrake um, Center in, in, uh, at Carleton University talking about their, 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 they have a division there for sensors and analytics. And I just want to give you a glimpse of the data that is not in your EMR. Right? So what they're coming out with is, for example, is they have a sensor that connects to your Wi-Fi. And based on the Wi-Fi um, and the ripples that humans cause in the electromagnetic field, they can identify movement. It's used for dementia care and Alzheimer's. They can identify movement. Um, they have a, um, they call it a, uh, um, just a little, a, a puck. Um, you can tell it's a very Canadian invention. It actually sits right underneath the, uh, the bed post. And based on that, they could identify your sleep patterns and your breathing. Um, and, the, and the list goes on. Um, in Edmonton, uh, a watch that uh, identifies your, your blood pressure based on light and, and um, throughput of um, blood flow through your veins. Um, all this is happening. You then have companies like Best Buy, uh, Health Solutions, which are pushing this to the consumer. All right? Now, what's not happening, um, and this is Dr. Bruce Wallace is saying, is nobody's aggregating this data and giving to the individual. It's either held in the EMRs, it's held in the private sector. Um, I mean, that's where our space is, as with, with Zamplo, is how do you aggregate and give the benefit to the individual? But all this data is creating with all this technology, technology-reported outcome measures, um, it's outside the EMR, it's outside clinical research, um, it's outside uh, um, patient care. And the classic systems, I would say Epic or REDCap, are not designed, they're designed 20 years ago and they're not designed to adapt to this distributed system of architecture of data. And so, so I, I do question that a centralized model of data capture will actually yield the, you know, um, as, as uh, we, we heard this morning, um, no patient data left behind. Right? It's, it's competing and conflicting against that. Uh, the last thing I would say, 
and this is the nature of, I think, the last few years, is 30% of all data that's generated today is healthcare data. Um, and that's growing, growing in, in volume and in fidelity as well. Um, so then the question is, how do you harness that? And I believe that it's not going to be the EMRs, it's not going to be a centralized health authority, it has to be the individual because that is the common denominator and they have the rights to their own data such that they could capture it uh, and provide it to whomever they want. That's what I see as the future of healthcare. You capture your own data, you're responsible, you're the custodian, and you give it whomever you want no matter where you are in the world. That's great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna invite the audience, if you do have questions, there are mics, um, two mics in the room, please do um, stand up and, and use those mics, use this opportunity to ask away. Again, we're gonna keep this really informal conversational. Um, in the meantime, I will start with some questions. Um, and then I'm expecting you guys to stand up and ask questions. Um, so let me start with, okay, so first, let, let, let me just tell these guys, because I didn't tell them yet. Um, they've never actually sat on a panel that I've facilitated. Uh, and I've, you know, as a good facilitator, I've sent them a list of questions that I was gonna ask them in the panel, so they're probably prepared for those, but they didn't realize that I typically never ask those questions. <laughs> I was actually told that you don't ask those questions, oh, so okay. I did, I did oh. not read those questions. <laughs> so, um, but, but, you know, just to be nice, I will ask the, the first question. Um, yeah, now that I know. Um, but, but, then, but then I do have the permission to veer off, because I just told you that I will. Um, this first question, and, and you know, at the risk of repeating yourself, like feel free to repeat yourself, but we had a conversation at lunch. Anne-Marie said, you know, like I love so far in the morning of this conference, but it just seems so overwhelming. It seems so big, like there's such challenges. Like how, how much progress have we made? Who's solving this? How can we, you know, come up with solutions for, for these big challenges? And I, I want you to use this opportunity to put her mind at ease and to say, in your respective perspective, so clinical trials, clinical practice, outside of clinical practice, what has been the most exciting development as it pertains to either access to data, generating new data? What has, what, what has just made you say, wow, like we're gonna get there, we're gonna solve this issue over the last recent history? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I've been working with a company out of uh, Israel uh, called MD Clone. Um, and, and I really feel that their product and their concept, uh, and, and just to be clear, conflicts of interest, I, 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 as a disclosure, I have no conflicts of interest to declare on this. It's a, the, the, they, they have a platform which is called the Adams Platform, which is, includes a, 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 a set of technologies that organize data from a variety of sources and then make it accessible to people through a variety of means, but one of the key pieces is something called synthetic data. Um, and what, what it does is it, trans, it, it translates uh, the, the, the population data that you have into what, what are really fake data sets. Um, and so it's fake, fake rows, it's real data, but it, 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 you cannot link back from those um, you cannot link back from the fake data back to the real patients. Um, so it, it becomes essentially non-person subject, non-human subject material, which means it does not require oversight to, 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 to disclose it, which means that people can then access the data. And like in theory, you can open it up to industry, you can open up to the general public, you can open up to patients, you can open up to obviously researchers or managers within an organization. <clears throat> and you, you know, the, the power that that gives an organization is, is, is impressive because what it does now is allows people to quote unquote, you know, play in the sandbox. It, it allows people to look at the data and answer questions that are important to them in their job, right? In their job, to your question about what, what's important to people and the, the, the fellow I mean, I can just think of the fellow now going to the attending, telling the attending, you know what, the, this practice doesn't work. Um, it does not work. You, you, you've been doing this. And, and that's the kind of thing that will be, will be 
there and is happening in, 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 in hospitals around the world now. Awesome. Any other one? Sure. Um, I was going to say the pandemic. That's the best thing that's happened. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so, so my wife's in the audience, and she, sometimes she can't tell when I'm being sarcastic and gets me in trouble. And, but let me put some color on that. And I, I, do, I say that um, with dark humor because clinicians and, and a lot of people in the public, we've all had uh, suffered from that pandemic. But look what, but, but uh, um, the, there's a phrase, um, necessity is the mother of all invention. And so let's go back to the pandemic pragmatically, right? And if during the pragmatic um, a pa a pa a pandemic, the number one, um, there was politicians got embarrassed. Embarrassment is a strong motivator, right? Second, there was challenges in the funding model for cl clinicians, and I say this with res respect, they need to be compensated, but, but why couldn't you go virtual, you know, 10, 15 years ago when the technology was there, right? But, but now there was a change that occurred, so now we could have virtual care. Um, then the, there's um, evidence of the data gap that occurs in the institutions, which made it hard to make good policy, and that was very public, right? So, um, and then there's the, um, the awareness of data and the importance of data to, to members of the public, to individuals. So there's a lot of trauma and, and hardship with, with the pandemic, but then there's also a byproduct of, of this visibility there, which then can be used today, which I do think accelerated digital health and, and this type of discussion that we're having today, it's, it's because of the pandemic. I do ask, like, you know, five years ago, would we have this conversation? Um, and so that's why in respect I know for the people there, are many people who suffer from the pandemic, uh, but let's make the lives of people better based on the, the trauma that we, we all experienced during that time. And, and these type of conversations and this future outlook is, is one way. Great, thank you. I'll be less controversial than that <laughs> comment, but still kind of controversial for a data section. Uh, data section. Um, to me, the thing that gives me the most hope is we're starting to see uh, studies look at, uh, especially in the clinical trial setting, what inclusion and exclusion criteria are truly needed um, versus what we are actively doing. You know, we, we are including way too many data points that are ultimately excluding people from our trials and creating a lot of noise where there shouldn't be. And now we're starting to see real studies quantifying how much of an improvement we can gain by eliminating certain areas where data really isn't providing any value. And so to me that, number one, it improves our ability to actually enroll and recruit the right kinds of, or sort of more people into these trials so that it does become more representative. Um, I think we got it called out by uh, um, Calvin and Winston about how clinical trials is maybe too exclusive. We need to be more inclusive. But the other thing is, is um, the reason why that makes me really uh, optimistic is if we can get rid of some of this noise, it makes more space to create data that truly matters, um, which I think these guys are really highlighting on where those gaps really are. Yeah, no, that's a great example, because even um, the last time we all got together for this conference, I think it was, um, there was a comment in the crowd to talk about the inclusion <clears throat> the inclusion exclusion criteria of clinical trials and how limiting that actually is. So, so it's great to bring that back up and see the evolution. We do have now audience questions, so we'll go to Barry first. Well, first of all, Henry, uh, I'm used to seeing you on Zoom running, and I wasn't seeing your sneakers, and my sense of accent, I don't think I would recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you wear your sneakers. So um, I was thinking about our main topic, about embedding clinical trials into clinical practice. So I think from a manufacturer's perspective, the patient values and preferences are obviously very important. 
So I, you know, I think it's a good question. The, the, first, the first thing is, within a medical center, let's say, do you have patients who have a condition of interest? That, 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 do, they, do they come to that, to that clinic? Do they go to that center? Do they go to that region? Um, and how many? And at what rate? Um, do they come, is there, you know, 100 a year, two a year? That, that matters if you're going to be doing research. It matters to the patients who are there. It also matters to the people trying to run the study. I, I guess on, next layer down is what are the experiences of care like for those people? Do we have, do we have any suggestion that it's amazing or do we have suggestion that perhaps it, there's something left to be desired? And do we have information in the data on their clinical condition at presentation? Uh, do we, and, and typically we would, you know, we would see laboratory results, we would see clinical notes describing their symptoms. Uh, we would, you know, sometimes see patient reported outcome measures tracked. Um, then we would see comorbidities, we would see uh, their natural history over time. And, uh, and, you know, from the data, we could also ask the question, how often are people coming to the clinic? What are the practices like in the clinic? Are they coming? Is it a five-day-a-week operation? I think someone was talking about that at lunch, I'm not sure, versus a seven-day-a-week uh, operation. And if you're a five-day-a-week operation, you're going to, and typically when you're a five-day-a-week operation, that really means you're a three-and-a-half-day-a-week operation because, you know, the clinicians have their academic day and there's holidays on Mondays and Fridays and, y y you know, it, it, it's not really a true seven-day-a-week operation, let's just say that. And, and so the idea is you could talk about the clinical practice, the clinical outcomes. You could talk about the, what's happening in the operation. And that information would be very useful for anyone who wants to set up a research project in that area. And, and all of that would be very easily obtained using data that's available in most EMRs, typically not being accessed today. That, that assumes that the people are actually coming to that one center. Right, so now let's, let's just focus sure. a little bit and think of it, it's a little bit more of a rare type of disease and, or, sure. or, or rare instance, rare mutation or whatever. So we really have to look further to find the patients. Clearly, well, so that was my point. If, if, like, there's, one, if there's no one there with the condition, you're gonna either have to aggregate more centers <laughs> or, or not do it. Um, and that means you're going to need to find networks of practices, networks of institutions who are willing to talk to each other, willing to share information, willing to um, be open potentially and say, hey, you know what, we're, we're willing to, to set the priorities, like you, to allow you to set the priorities for us. Um, we're willing to share what we have with you. Um, and those networks, I think, are what are, are as much lacking as there is about the technical know-how for sharing data. Um. So can I jump in? You know, one of, the, one of the things that always bothers me is how different clinical trials are from clinical practice. And to me, what I would love to see is actually that clinical practice moves more like clinical trials does. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, I think Winston had called out that in Alberta, um, they, use pa they, do, they do deploy a patient reported outcome measure. They use, uh, they use ESAS on all their patients. We, we do that as well in, in Ontario. Um, ESAS is not correlated with health-related quality of life measures. So we have all this great PRO data, but we can't actually use that for determining whether or not, you know, what someone's quality of life truly is. And so we don't have the data that we would ultimately need to understand what the baseline population's health-related quality of life is or how an individual's health-related quality of life actually changes throughout the course of their treatment. Imagine just getting rid of ESAS and actually using a health-related quality of life measure. Now all of a sudden we've got something that we can compare in a real-world data set versus a single-arm clinical trial maybe, or even in a randomized trial, we, you know, we've got, we've got real-world data that we can, we can really compare like with like. And so similarly, when we're deploying clinical trials, it doesn't feel like 
something totally different. It feels like the same, the same part of what we always do in our clinical practice. So maybe I'm kind of answering it backwards because you had asked what, you know, if you were the company, but if I was a company right now, actually, I guess I, I, I am a you company, are. <laughs> you know, I'd like, I, you know, I'm, we've been talking to folks around, you know, how can, how can their general practice actually look more like the trials so that when we do launch trials there, it just feels like this is just what we do. We do have a bit of a challenge with clinical governance. Even if the clinical practice decided we were going to measure using measure X and, uh, you know, you talked, and you, you, you know, I just, there's two kind of important steps. One is you'd have to get your EMR in your practice to adopt changes within that EMR to make it easy for people to ask and document, whether that be the patient or the provider to do the, uh, the documentation. But the second step is you actually have to get people to document, <laughs> ask and document in a, in a routine way. And, and I would just say that that's really not necessarily, uh, that, that's probably, you know, getting the IT department to do your EMR changes is one thing, but getting your doctor colleagues or your nursing colleagues or your patients to consistently fill out forms, um, okay. unless there's value to them, yeah. is a really, really important step, which is often not thought about um, yeah. and needs to be dug in on because if you don't, and that's where, the, so the, the, the clinical governance and the governance of the health system start to become increasingly important to driving the types of changes you're talking about, Barry. All right. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, I, I do want to keep us on time because I recognize that we're so, hitting up. So we'll go one last question. Sure. Yeah, and, then, um, and I'm so glad you finished with that, um, Alan, because I'm putting on my patient hat right now. I'm just going to change you guys' focus a little bit. And I loved your stories. Your stories are great to help us understand where you're coming from. So I appreciate um, your emphasis and patient centricity. But I sometimes question, as a patient, um, researchers and clinicians, and I'm an ex-clinician, uh, reality of truly understanding what we need or what we want. So my question is, I live with four chronic conditions. All of these chronic conditions cause severe pain on a daily basis, for which I take many different kind of treatments, and I am a very you know, proponent of self-management. You look at me, you would never know I'm a disabled person. I'm a very disabled person. But I, I deal with it. I see four different specialists. There's over 8,600 hours in a year. I see my specialist maybe once a year for maybe half an hour. So take two hours off of that, maybe four hours off of that. Who is asking the patients, maybe through the patient organizations or all the people that you see as clinicians, what they want to have reported on? I'll tell you, so many of my peers living with chronic conditions create, because they're as brilliant as you guys, their own little databases of how they're getting information so that they can follow trends and tracks and everything else and go to you and tell you, you know, this is what's happening, this is what I'm seeing, and you didn't think this was something worrisome. To me, it is. Here's what I'm, you know, wanting to talk about. How do we do that part and interrelate it so that we really have data truly available that is about the person? I have more data available to me about my banking and stocking functions than I do about my inner body workings, according to my diseases. So how do we really integrate what patients want on a chronic field or living every single day when they're not in acute care, they're not part of the hospital system, et cetera, um, and then they're able to get it? And that is why I think all of these tell us this and Best Buy that and Shoppers Drug Mart or whatever, people are going out of their minds wanting to get something that they can't have because it's not developed yet. So they're looking at other industries to develop that might or might not have the healthcare knowledge and background. So I hope I'm clear enough my mm -hmm. question, but how do you approach uh, getting yeah. the real understanding of what patients want in di the different data sets? Yeah. I, I think what you described is that life happens outside the doctor's office. And so far what I, I hear, I say with respect, it's how does a clinician get the data, right? How do we integrate a centralized uh, clinical uh, system? I mean, part of Zample, Zample started because of lived experience as a, a caregiver and aggregating the data and, and making it uh, useful for the individual and then it follows, follows the person. Uh, we did it manually. So many people, in you go to the cancer centers, they're walking around with binders. It's a reflection of the fragmentation. But when it comes to, like, and I'll, I'll keep this short, I think one of the things that's missing in clinical trials as well as in, in clinical care is um, 
to, to Alan's point, is give value to the individual. Allow them to aggregate this data and make use of it and advocate for, it for themselves, and you might yield better data for clinical research and also clinical care. Flip the model. That's what we advocate. Flip the model because there are so many permutations of diseases that an individual could have that that a centralized system I don't think can do that, and you also cannot get longitudinal data that follows the individual um, with with our healthcare with the way the architecture of our healthcare system. Linda, I don't I don't have like if I knew the answer to that I probably would be sitting on a beach somewhere. Chilling, chilling out in the in, in the sun because it would you know it's a, it's an important topic that uh, the the world needs. M my sense is that you know we do need population level data because that you compare yourself to the mil the people like you and you can see what you need to do to get better. Um, at the same token, it has to be very meaningful to you. Um, there are institutions globally who are doing work to develop approaches for measuring symptoms and, and outcomes in a standardized way that's acceptable, to, like that is actually patient-centered. It, it is, it's done by patients first. Um, I, I just bring your attention to the ICHOM in, uh, program. And there's like literally thousands of people working on that problem with them where I, I feel that there's a, a need for some form of standardization because if, if everyone is doing it their way, it's very difficult to compare and say what's meaningful. Um, and that's what you need to do to say if something works, right? And so, but, but on the same token, it does have to be contextualized and, and then made relevant for folks. And, and I think that's where the IT really starts to make it easier for folks to do it because you can match it. I'll just say one last thing. Until our governments and the pay, people who pay for healthcare actually pay us as providers to, to develop, to deliver a patient-centered service, we'll con we will, until they do that, we'll continue to do this provider-centered world that we live in because that's how we're paid. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds very cynical, but, but that's, you do what you're paid to do, right? Like you show up to work and do what your boss tells you to do. And if your boss is telling you to see more patients, you'll see more patients. If your patient's saying, make sure their, 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 their needs are looked after, you're gonna make sure their needs are looked after. And I, I know that's, I, I, that's very cynical, but that's, I, it, I think it starts with who the payer is and what they're paying for. So, so here's another radical idea. <laughs> How about we take our healthcare dollars and give it to the individuals and they pay the doctors and that you create agency for the individual. Because right now, one eye is always on the provider, right? And it, it'll change the behavior because because you're paying for this service. You're not really paying for it. The government will cover you. This is actually, I believe, a model in Sweden where, where it, they flipped it and give it to the individual and they go to the private or they go to a public uh, care facility. But what you create is agency. That's a perfect way to end it. Next year? No, 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 no. That, that's <laughs> we we were just saying that's that's where we're gonna end it. Um, so oh, no. so. We, <laughs> uh, apologies, Sam Marie, for going a little bit over time, but I'm gonna hand it back to you.